So here I am again. Doug Stegmeyer is panned to the left with the bass locked down. Following the rhythmic punch of the drums, the shimmer of the cymbal hits are piercing through a pitch black background. I can hear into the room, the air, the distance between the kit and the rest of the band. The stage is wide, and there is a wall of transparency staring back at me that a traditional box speaker simply cannot compete with. Mr. Steve Kahn's acoustic is tickling the outside of my right ear, and sounds like he's floating somewhere a few feet in front of my bass traps. Billy Joel is dead center, standing six feet away from my listening position, suspended between the mighty Magnapan point sevens. I am soaking it all in. Life is good. And yes, Billy, only the good die young. Reflecting back to the first time I heard the point sevens in house, I have to chuckle to myself. Getting here was much more challenging than I ever thought it would be. Folks, welcome back to New Record Day. Let's take a little adventure and discover what it takes to give these beautiful speakers the voice they were destined to sing with. The first time I plugged in the Magnapan point sevens to my Rogue reference gear, I thought something was very wrong. With a slight panic, I considered the possibility that maybe I ended up with a bum pair or worse, blew something. Thumbing through the manual and rechecking all my connections, I threw on Bella Flex Cosmic Hippo and heard one of the least pleasant sounds a reviewer can hear. As the bass notes hit, an unpleasant slap of distortion made its way to my ears, even at moderate volume levels never getting past the 90 dB breaking point. My goodness sakes, this is not what I was hoping for, and it led to a phone conversation with Magnapan mentioning that, well maybe that particular song is just not the right pick for these speakers. Okay, fair enough. I tried something a little less aggressive and tossed on Madeline Peru and would you believe it? While not as severe, the same ugly distorted sound managed to creep its way back into the mix and left me in despair. Yanking out the Stereo 100, I decided to go in a different direction and tossed in the first Watt F6 into the mix. While only pumping 50 watts of blood into the Maggie's 4 ohm tap, these are beautifully rendered Class A watts and I had a feeling the F6 wouldn't walk away embarrassed. Well, I was wrong. Not only did the first watt suffer from the same issues of popcorn bass, it also managed to move in the wrong direction in every other category under the audiophile sun. It was at this very moment that I knew everything I had read about the Maggie's needing serious firepower had to be true. Both the Stereo 100 and F6 are amazing amplifiers, and I knew they had the potential to sound like magic. There was something else here at play, and pointing the fingers at Rogue Audio or First Watt wasn't going to solve a dang thing. Then it hit me. I remembered something. Something tucked away at a friend's house. Probably under a bed with a thin layer of dust on its top cover. Yeah, what I needed, what the Maggies needed was... Hey man, it's me. I need the beast. Dang, man, you're really good. Mr. Brene, the beast. Say hello to the Carver M4.0T. High current, solid state muscle and rated at 375 watts into eight ohms and 500, count them, 500 bone crushing watts into four ohms. Sure, it's long out of production, but I have a review to save, and before yanking out a 100 pound pass labs that costs as much as a used car, I wanted to try something affordable, even if you had to consider the used market in order to get the party started. With the carver engaged, I dropped the needle on Bella Fleck for a second time and prepared myself for battle. Slowly raising the volume of my Rogue 99 Super Magnum, I could hear the bass creeping up the side of the stage as the decibels increase with each press of the button. 
As I hit the mid-80s and above, not only were we painting a picture of finesse and control, the entire stage was wider, and the tip-top extension down to the very bottom of the barrel was far more engaging. Just like waiting for the clouds to part after stormy weather, I could almost imagine Wendell Diller's descent, giving me an epic high five followed by a few lightning bolts to remind me what a doofus I was for ever questioning the .7's potential when they've had their Wheaties for breakfast. Yeah, folks, now we are cooking with fire. Before we get to the listening impressions, I want to take a moment and explain a few things about placement. The Magnapans need room to breathe. As tempted as you might be to slide them back against the front wall to get them out of the way in hopes to score some wife approval points, don't do it. It will only lead to an RMA right back to Magnapan. As the manual suggests, they need to be a good three feet away from the front wall, and in my room, I found them really to wake up around four and a half to five and a half feet in. A good portion of the panel is dedicated to bass, and a smaller strip to treble. You can easily tell the difference when looking straight at the speaker as the lines of the treble side are closer together. The manual suggests there are no rules on whether you want the treble side of the speaker facing in or out, and it could come down to how many people are sharing the sweet spot. The top end extension of the Magnapans will please anyone looking for something smooth and refined without a single ounce of ice pick nonsense. While there is more than enough detailed resolution in the upper elevations, I would place the top end extension of the .7 smack dab in the middle of neutral. With the presentation of the treble being the key difference between what you can expect apart from a traditional speaker, the .7s have an airy quality that creates depth between you and the music. Listening to Ben Howard's Every Kingdom, I was able to hear all the micro details I know so well on this record, but at the same time, they weren't shouting at me to take notice. Making my way through the rest of the album, the subtle nuances of every single pluck and strum were floating in front of me without sounding contrived or artificial. Switching gears for something upbeat, I tried the latest release from Alabama Shakes, Sound and Color. Again, the percussive hits, snaps, and smacks of the drum kit and top-end extension of acoustics brought enough spark to the party, but never sounded shrill or edgy. Bottom line, those who are in love with the excitement of traditional tweeters, I'd encourage an audition before taking the plunge. For those looking to trade front-row seating of Cymbal Town or tired of listening fatigue, you will find the .7's top end as lovely and engaging as anything you can possibly imagine. The mid-range on the Magnapans is where these speakers have spawned a cult-like following and reputation of being second to none. After spinning Analog Productions' beautifully mastered T for the Tillerman, I wholeheartedly agree with the masses that if you want to hear what mid-range transparency and speed is all about, the Maggies have few rivals. Anything mid-band is tall and wide with laser beam focus and razor sharp details surrounding every single note in the mix. Dropping the needle on Pines of Rome, I was greeted with an orchestra chilling out in my living room. By the end of the performance, I knew every single musician by name. How many times they squirmed or squeaked in their seat? How many times Bob sneezed during the second movement? Sorry, Bob, but that was a little ridiculous. And how many times Kathy smacked Ken with her bow for inappropriate behavior? Okay, so maybe this is an exaggeration, but seriously, folks, the Maggies are like that. They transport you. You are there, leaving your gear and two speakers far behind. The bass on the Maggies is tricky to get right, and after hard lessons learned, it all comes down to one thing, high current power. I cannot stress this enough, and I hope this is the last and final nail in the coffin that makes it crystal clear. The mighty Magnapans need power. Loads and loads of power. Whatever number you have in your head, double it and you're halfway there. Is the horse dead? Are we on the same page? Okay, cool. Let us proceed. The bass on the .7s is not what I would call earth-shattering by any stretch of the imagination. 
And I would be a fool to make the claim that you don't need the help of subwoofers to get the full experience of top to bottom extension. With that being said, in my 15 by 14 foot room, I found there to be enough bass to account for 70% of the music that I listened to. Perhaps I'm getting old and my days of clubbing are coming to an end, but the .7's bass is quite good, especially when you're putting into perspective it's coming from a 1 inch thick speaker. I like to think that those looking to play at moderate volumes or have a room similar to mine or even smaller, you're going to be just fine. How does the bass sound? Well, it's fast, it's articulate, it's tuned with precision. Perhaps the bass could be described as lean, but I suspect that what I'm really hearing is the absence of a box. A bass guitar sounds like a bass guitar. A kick drum sounds like a kick drum. Toms and floor toms offer depth, and when you hear the snap of the stick hit the head of the drum, it's like listening to the real thing. I guess what I'm getting at is this. The bass on the point sevens is about accuracy and telling you the truth. Simple as that. So, what about those that want to bring the thunder? What about those that want to smash walls and combine the strengths of the Maggies with serious dynamics that pressurize the room and rattle the windows? Sure, we can do that. With the brilliant suggestion of Ryan from Red Dragon Audio, I picked up a couple high-pass filters from Harrison Labs that allow me to relieve the bass duty from the .7s and hand over the hard work to none other than the mighty PC-2000. What? N not enough? I mean, seriously. That thing packs a serious punch, guys. It will be way more than what we need. Okay, okay, but don't come crying to me and tell me that I didn't warn you. With two PC-2000 set up in stereo, <gasps> again, dropping the needle on Bellaflex Cosmic Hippo. You guys wanted speed. Top-end extension with unrivaled transparency in the mid-range combined with dynamic slam. Well, you got it. You wanted a soundstage tall enough to reach Godzilla and strong enough to kick the snot out of him at the same time. No problemo. Backed by the mighty PC-2000s and reaching levels loud enough to wake your neighbor's neighbor's neighbors. This, folks, this is it. The real deal. Detail rich music with top to bottom resolution. A few other combos worked well with the Magnapans that gives hints of what's needed to get the party started on the right note. Red Dragon Audio sent over their new S500, which brings 250 watts to the 8 ohm party and 500 to 4 ohms. Paired with the .7s, the Dragons blended together with the Maggies like peanut butter goes with jelly. I find the S500 to be quite linear and doesn't exaggerate any specific frequency which really opens the doors to some super cool options upstream. The input buffer of the S500 allowed me to use whatever the heck I was in the mood for without any kind of impedance issues. Combined with my 99 Super Magnum, this sprinkled some 2 magic into the mix and added a little heft and weight to the midband. Bottom line. For those that are looking for a companion to mate with your Maggies in the $2,000 range, the S500 should definitely be on your shopping list. For those that don't want to mess with separate components, the recently reviewed Parasound Integrated certainly got the Maggie singing pretty close to the level of authority as the Dragons and Carver. I think the Carver offered a more exciting mid-range, but the Parasound seemed to do a better job at keeping it together in the mid-bass and lower octaves. I also felt like the Parasound offered a more truthful top end, as opposed to the slightly rolled Carver. If you're planning on getting creative with the high and low pass connections on the back, the Parasound would be a fantastic option for the Maggies, using other power amps and powered subwoofers. The final combo, which ended up being my personal favorite, would require some goodwill or eBay hunting. If you're willing to do the work, an older Yamaha 2010 is an absolute winner when it comes to manhandling the Maggies and providing the strength needed to get them to wake up and shout. With a fantastic sounding built-in phono, all you need is a decent turntable and you're done. 
pre-1980s, this bad boy doesn't even have a CD input. And I read on those internets that even if you attempted to plug one in, the Yamaha will literally devour it. Okay, joking aside, sure, you won't have all the high-tech modern flexibility of the Paris sound, but you could easily use the other inputs for whatever you decide to plug in. If you want to use subs, you could use the preamp outputs or the high-level speaker connections as well. The Yamaha is all muscle, and regardless of the moderate 120 watt power rating, I believe with all my heart, Team Yamaha managed to stuff in the DNA of Robocop, Mr. T, and Chuck Norris into the power section of this mother flower. Being able to dial in whatever I wanted with the analog tone circuit, I was able to convincingly mimic every combo used in this review. You know, if there is one review that I'm really nervous about being taken the wrong way, it's probably this one. Am I saying that Maggie's won't work well with tubes? Well, no. But after hearing how well they do with serious muscle delivered from solid state, that's where you're going to find my recommendation. In regards to feedback, the only thing I have here is the plexiglass stands are not my favorite. Being bound by two screws, I noticed that no matter how tight I had them, the plexi didn't seem to hold the stands as sturdy as I would like to see. The good news here is they're optional, so don't buy them. You can go with the L brackets, which won't have the same problem as the plexiglass pedestals. All in all, I can't recommend the Maggie Point 7s enough. Magnapan, you guys are most welcome here at New Record Day. I'd love to move up the line and see what happens when we get into the 1.7s or even bigger. Either way, folks, thanks for stopping by. And as always, take it easy.